I'm here in Amsterdam for Health Europe 2024, the region's most important healthcare event. I was lucky enough to not only attend to be absorbed in the networking and learning, but I was also hosting interviews on health podcasts called The Beat, right here on the forum stage. So over the last three or four days here at Health Europe, I've recorded so many interviews with headline speakers, emerging innovators and inspiring thought leaders. And you'll hear just a small handful of those conversations in this Talking Health Tech podcast episode today. But to catch all of those conversations, subscribe to a podcast called The Beat, hosted by Health, which is in the show notes of this episode. Also, since this is a health event, you know that there's not just good quality conversations, but we're also allowed to have a little bit of fun too. So over on the Talking Health Tech Instagram account, you'll find a good amount of behind the scenes and bonus content, including some interviews recorded on pedal boats, bikes, and who knows what else. Collaboration starts with a conversation team, Health Tech. Oh, let's make it happen. Welcome to Talking Health Tech, featuring content and community about technology and healthcare. We acknowledge the traditional owners of lands these conversations were recorded and pay respect to elders past and present. Welcome to the beat. My name's Peter Birch. We're here at Health Europe 2024. I'm joined by Paula Belostos Mugerza from Carney Paula. Welcome to the stage. Thank you very, very much. It's really nice to meet you. Pete from the beat, as I uh, hate your vehicles now. <laughs> that's right. That's, we'll have to own that one. So, Paula, look, from Carney, uh, I'd love to learn a little bit more about the work you're doing with Carney. Amazing. So, I lead our global healthcare and life sciences practice. So, that's sort of my day job. But my real passion is about how can we reduce inequity um, when it comes to gender? So how can we improve the lives of all of the women um, around the world? So that's sort of my, my sidekick and my hobby, but it's really what has taken over um, our, our week here at uh, Health Europe. Yeah, absolutely. And so the, um, tell me more about what that then manifests into. Like it's an important issue to, to drive the train, but what, what does that uh, lead you to, um, to do on a day to day? So the first thing is really to understand um, what the problem is. And if we think about the, 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 the topic of women's health, it's uh, sort of multifactorial, but it starts with two things. The first thing is just the biological determinants. Our bodies are different. Uh, and the second piece is the social determinants. How society perceives the value of your life versus my life is actually really different. And all of that then results in, in a number of areas that we need to try and fix. So to give you an example, um, if you and I had the same condition, it would take me four times as longer to get diagnosed than it would you, potentially. If you and I were having a heart attack right now on stage, I would have seven times more chances of being misdiagnosed or being sent home in the middle of a heart attack compared to you, which is crazy, right? And it's not right. Um, and I think some of it comes from, from a number of areas. So, for example, education. So if we think about childhood education, if I think about medical school education, if I take the UK where I live, 41% of medical schools, the women's health part of the curriculum, the menopause and all of the hormonal health is optional uh, for somebody going through medical school. If we then take research and development, so think about pain medication. So um, the majority of the pain sufferers will be women, eight, eight out of 10 or seven out of 10. Um, and if we think about clinical trials, 80% of those clinical trials for pain medication, those drugs have only been tested on male mice or on men. Uh, if I give you another example, uh, a woman going through the healthcare system, so three times as likely to get her consents uh, dismissed compared to a man. And then finally, on investment, if we think about digital health and a lot of the companies that we see uh, on the shop floor at Health Europe, uh, only 3% of all of the funding is going towards femtech. So the, the kind of technology digital health that is applied to women's health issues. So lots of different um, factors at play. And I think the reality is, is back to where we started, which is we don't understand it. We really just don't understand the biological differences between you and I. The, a lot of the texts still use reference man, the man that is standing like that in a circle. So that, that's how we, how we study medicine. Um, the second piece is that we are not investing in it. And then finally, maybe we are just not 
prioritizing us equally. Yeah. Um, so we've got to do something about it. Um, it's not fair. It's not right. And also it can unlock a lot of uh, money in, in society because healthy women are at the heart of uh, economic development. Um, and there's a lot of opportunity to just bring more um, dollars into GDP and also just do the right thing. Yeah, absolutely. I do the right thing. Look, I, I, I think about that and I, and I look around the room and, uh, um, and some of these stats sometimes shock people. Sometimes we'll go, yeah, I know it's awful. And this is like a, a not the place to be. And we've got the advocates looking to do things. And we've touched on a few things about we, we might need more investment into uh, or w- women-led, fa- uh, yeah, women founders that lead organizations. Um, there may be policy reform. There may be rules that need to be set in place. Where do you see, uh, sometimes it feels a bit too big, overwhelming. Yeah. So where do you see that, you know, particularly people attending Health Europe or, you know, their organizations, how can we start making those steps towards improvement? So that was a little bit of uh, what happened to us last year. So when we started to look into it more systematically, we were just just daunted by, we have this like big elephant and we need to start eating it. And do I start from the trunk or from the tail or from the side? And like, uh, mm. or do I just like step behind and just let somebody else fix it? Cause it's too complicated. <laughs> right. um, but then we just said, you know, um, a little bit like when you have kids, you need a village around you to raise them. So we thought what well, better than start to put pe- putting people together and people that can tackle all of those angles. So we need the regulators, we need the policymakers, but then we need the pharma companies and we need the innovators and we need academia and we need you and I to care about it. Um, and that's what we wanted to do. So we started to bring some organizations together. We wrote this open letter um, and at the beginning there wasn't a lot of movement. And then we thought we're just going to try and explode it and go to and speak to everybody that we know. Your mum, your dad, your aunts, your colleagues, your neighbours, somebody that you bump into the street. Let's just talk to them about it. And we started to get all of these organisations signed up onto this letter. And then we kind of uh, presented it at the World Economic Forum in in Davos. And then all of a sudden, the big people were listening. Uh, And two things happen when the big people listen. Then everybody else starts to listen. But then also it can become very cumbersome and very slow to move. So then we thought, okay, we need to find an antidote to that. So let's make it grassroots and let's create a community and bring everybody together and now we're sitting at around 140, 150 organizations and with a lot of like very motivated, very committed individuals uh, behind that just want to work on some areas where we think we can make the, the biggest change. We might not be able to solve everything immediately, but we've got five areas that we want to uh, focus on around reproductive health, brain health, heart health, autoimmune disease and cancer. And if we, even if we make a little dent in those five, we'll already be making a massive difference. Yeah, amazing. That sounds... That sounds great to bring those different stakeholders together. I love that uh, you, you've taken that approach. These organizations, the 150 organizations, I'm going to guess that some are probably a, a little bit competing, some are complementary, but they're for a common cause. Completely. And it has been like one of the most joyful things of, uh, of this week that we have an advisory board and we have competitors um, sitting in the same advisory board and just seeing them grabbing a glass of wine just leaving their logos and leaving their colors behind and just really thinking about what is the mission and how can I, when I'm side by side competing for say the same um, drug for cervical cancer, but I know that if we join arms and we join forces on this, we probably are going to get closer to being able to eradicate this disease. And just that at the end of the day is coming down to human to human connection. And that's really what we want to create. Just humans that have got a, this cause that they want to, that they want to work on and that they're leaving just the, the corporate stuff behind and trying to do something yeah. good. So is this community rallying around the, the, that important topic of um, women's health, particularly represented on the company side? Uh, whereabouts is it based? Is it a global thing? It's a global thing. Uh, one of the things that we are kind of working on, it is very global north based. So it's very much kind of centered around the very developed economies. So the US, Europe and, and the developed economies in, in Asia Pac. But the reality is, if you think cervical cancer that we were talking about um, a minute ago, the majority of the mortality is actually sitting in the lower middle income countries. So what we are doing there is working with some of the multilateral organizations, so like um, the Global Alliance for Vaccination, we have got the World uh, Health Organization Foundation and some others that can tap into um, the, the problem that we've got in the lower middle income countries and are going to be able to be much more effective than a collection of corporates trying to, uh, to go into there. Yeah. And, and, and what do these organizations that are part of the, um, the cause do? Like you mentioned the, 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 the connections, but yeah, take me through that. So three things that we want to do together with them. So the first thing that, that we are trying to do is how themselves and as an organization can look at their own operations and, and see where am I failing women? So we're creating an index, one per sector, to see, okay, if I'm a pharma company, to give you an example, how am I making portfolio investment decisions? 
How am I developing and designing my clinical trials? How am I educating my clinicians? How am I designing my products? Like the pill size, the tightness of the bottle, everything. Uh, so how am I serving women in that way so that they understand where they are and they can make the individual decisions of how to improve their own company? So that's on a company by company basis. Um, and we're doing the same for medtech, for private equity, for healthcare providers, the lot. Then you go into the second piece, which is just these human connections that I talked about. Magic is happening just because we're putting people that wouldn't know each other together in the same room. And just a lot of uh, kind of conversation is, are starting to, uh, to spark on that. Yeah. And then the final piece is just actually putting their brains together for them to kind of come up with some solutions in these five areas that, uh, that I talked about. And we ran an incredible um, ideation session two days ago. Um, we had 120 people that didn't know each other at all from all of these various companies, some in the community, some that were just like walking past. And they came into the ideation session and we, um, we presented the concepts earlier today on how to improve menstrual health, how to eliminate cervical cancer, how to measure if a woman is uh, going towards neurodegeneration with Alzheimer's disease, how to improve uh, the experience and the diagnostic rate of uh, autoimmune disease, and then how do we drive the capital um, into women's health? So we developed five concepts. Then now that group of people can take into actual um, development and execution. Yeah, amazing. Hey, look, we've, oh, we could keep talking, but we're going to hit time. <laughs> but it looks like we've captured a lot of uh, attention from those that are attending live at Health Europe. Uh, and there'll be those that will be listening to the podcast as well that want to contribute or learn more. How can they do that? So they can email us on womenshealth.cani.com. Um, or they can go on LinkedIn and find W Health, uh, which is their community. We'll bring you into the LinkedIn community. And then from there, let's see what magic happens. Amazing. Let's make it happen. Paula, thank you so much for joining us on the bait. Thank you. Welcome to The Beat. My name's Peter Birch. We're here at Health Europe 2024. I'm joined by Roland Ealing from AWS. Roland, thanks so much for joining us on the stage. How are you? Very well. Thank you very much for the invitation. Yes, it's great to... I'm keen to dive into so much more. I'm not sure where to start because AWS are very active within the healthcare space and here at Health Europe 2024. Firstly, for those that don't know, can you introduce yourself and a bit more about AWS and healthcare specifically? Sure. Um, my name is Dr. Roland Illing. I'm the Director and Chief Medical Officer for Global Healthcare and Nonprofits at Amazon Web Services. I'm actually an academic interventional radiologist by background. Uh, and still a faculty member at University College London, uh, but spent five years in Europe um, as chief medical officer of a big imaging intervention group, and that really led me into cloud technology and uh, the role I'm in today. Yeah, amazing. And so cloud technology, super important for a lot of the startups that are around the patients, uh, pervasive across healthcare. But uh, so, so AWS's priorities in healthcare, um, uh, talk to me a little bit more about uh, how you approach the healthcare market. Sure. I think the first thing is to differentiate AWS from Amazon.com Health Services. So Amazon Web Services is the technology arm of Amazon, and we provide uh, cloud infrastructure to all kinds of healthcare providers, payers, and health technology companies to really democratize access to global computing power, storage, and solutions. That differs from Amazon.com, which is much more in the the direct delivery of care, such as One Medical, Amazon Pharmacy, you may have heard those. Yeah. They are our customers in the same way the likes of Philips or GE are also customers. So we're very proud to support, support global healthcare organizations around the world, including national governments. So I spend a lot of my time speaking to governments and health systems about how they can really improve their data strategy and their overall um, digitization by using cloud technology. Yeah, got you. I... I always think about, you know, with cloud technology, someone from the outside might think, well, it's, it's just somewhere to put the information. So why would Amazon Web Services need a, such a strong focus on healthcare? Because if it's healthcare, if it's any industry, it could live on the cloud. What, what's so what, different about healthcare? I think, I think that's a great question. Again, a lot of people consider cloud as just kind of backup. Like you have your mo photo, photo, you have your photos on the camera and just back them up somewhere. Yeah, yeah. I, think, I think a lot of... Oh, well, people don't realize is that a lot of cloud is also the compute aspect. Mm. So if you're talking about high performance computing or actually training AI, the amount of computing that's required to train AI models, especially generative AI models, is almost impossible to get enough computing power to do this unless you are a large you know, international organization 
that computing aspect of it is often overlooked. And so what we do is we can democratize access to the power of computing as well as storage mm -hmm. to enable organizations of any size really to build generative AI from scratch. And so we also want to democratize access to foundation models. So organizations that are building large language models, large data models, we can actually have infrastructure where organizations can tap into those models in order to then build new solutions on top. Yeah. And so that's why we can support organizations as large as GE and Illumina and Philips, but also startups. And that's what we're seeing at Health with amazing healthcare ecosystem of startups who are building natively in the cloud. Yeah, interesting. I'll, I'd love to learn more about these partners too and, and what they're doing because I guess the success of AWS is wholly and solely reliant on the success of partners and the continued innovation in that sense. So being able to have that close relationship, I expect, is critical. You mentioned some of those larger organizations like the G and Philips. Any examples you can share with us in terms of how a close collaboration between one of your larger partners and AWS would then result in um, some better healthcare services or outcomes for patients? Sure. Um, so we're very much focused on primitive. So um, services, managed packets of code, which can do discrete jobs and that they're managed by AWS. And so we're actually building discrete services that manage health data types. So for instance, text data is a common ubiquitous data type from electronic medical records or any kind of notes. So it develops a service which can actually ingest that data and extract medical meaning from it. Now, it's not a solution. It's not an end-to-end -end thing an organization would buy. It's a component part of electronic medical records of the future. Hmm. Likewise, we're building a primitive around imaging. So most medical imaging, be it radiology or pathology or even visible light imaging, actually is the, the data type is DICOM data. That's the kind of data packet. Yeah. And so we've built a service called AWS Health Imaging, which actually can ingest DICOM data, intelligently tier it to be the most cost-efficient way of storing that, and then a streaming engine built into endpoints. And so we believe that this microservice, this primitive, will be the engine which will drive PAX systems in the future. So picture archiving and communication systems, which are ubiquitous in healthcare, and are being built by Philips, GE, and Telerad, Agfa, all of these different systems, we want AWS Health Imaging to be the kind of foundation of these systems of the future. We do not want to build end-to-end -end solutions, like with a front, of, like end-to-end, -end, but to be the most ubiquitous platform, again, to democratize access to this technology, because some of this technology is just bread and butter. Every organization that wants to get into the imaging space or the diagnostic space has to do the same thing. So if we can do that bit of heavy lifting on behalf of the organizations, that will allow the organizations to really think ahead about the value-added services that they can build to differentiate them in the market. I was going to say, you know, I guess if everyone was using the same thing, there'd be no competition. But if like there's a point in which there's, there's no need for uh, a larger, even a, particularly for a startup, which we'll come to in a second, to to invest in services that are already there, but then it's on top, they can build the extra bits. Of so here's an analogy. Mm. So... Amazon Prime Video is hosted on AWS because AWS has a great video streaming service. AWS also hosts Disney Plus. Yeah, right. And Hulu mm. and Netflix <laughs> because all of those video streaming services that have content want to use the best and most robust video streaming platform to get their content to end users. Yeah. And so that in that way, exactly the same for healthcare. Organizations are choosing AWS because they want the most robust and resilient and secure platform to host their data. And so that's what we see is our, our mission is to enable access and delivery of person-centered care to improve outcomes at a lower cost by accelerating the digitization and utilization of healthcare data. And the key is to enable. We don't want to handle the data ourselves. We don't want to access the data or use it. We want to be able to host it and make it available and democratize access to it, as I've said, to the largest number of end users via our partners. Got it, got it. Hey, look, just behind us here on the startup stage, there's a lot of great new innovations, emerging technologies that um, likely will need cloud services. And AWS, uh, I know startups are, are a critical partner and uh, a big part of what you do. For those emerging startups that might be thinking about building solutions and how, like, what they might need from cloud, where do you find the biggest priorities or, or perhaps you know, stumbling blocks or things that slow those startups down that they can get on top of early to get their solution out to market? Well, I think startups are leveraging AWS. First of all, because it's a really good environment to build in. So 80% of startups that build in the cloud build on AWS. <laughs> and 
the reason is they've just got more tools. There's a deeper s- tool set to build, and it's a very good development environment. So that's what we're seeing startups come to AWS to, to do. Having these microservices allows them to build faster. So instead of having to code natively from scratch, you can build solutions with these services, and actually the time to build new solutions decreases by around 40% when you use this deep and broad set of services. The other thing is startups don't need to invest in hardware because if you want to build a new application, you need to invest in computers and IT equipment to do it. This is available over the internet. And so you can literally get two people together, have a good idea, and you can start building immediately using the tools that are available. And then when you've built it, you can then scale it out because you want your whatever the solution is, in the hands of the broadest number of people. And AWS has three times more data centers globally than the next largest cloud. Hmm. And when it comes to healthcare in particular, we want to have the most robust cloud. So as a radiologist, so my background is a, is a clinical radiologist, I just want to make sure that my system comes on when I use it. You know, otherwise, you have the spinning wheel of doom we don't need where they're like, oh, where's my, where are my images? They need to load. And so, again, we have less than half the outages of the next most available cloud and less than the third of the downtime. So it's very important to understand that not all clouds are built equally. Yeah. And so the resilience and the robustness of the infrastructure is really important. And that's, I think, driving the choice of startups. That's critical, yeah. Hey, lastly, Dr. Drilling, we've got uh, a lot of those different innovators at different stages and stakeholders here at Health Europe. We've learned a lot about the region. Um, any particular key takeaways that people, as they head back home or go back to their health systems within Europe, can, can take to think about how innovation is going to change healthcare over the next 12, 24? Yeah, I guess, I guess that I'd, take, I'd have two things as takeaways. The first is that there is a dramatic shift to cloud taking place in production. So again, back to your earlier point, where organizations think, well, you can just back up stuff, but we'll keep it on premises. Mm. With all of the security challenges at the moment that are going on globally and ransomware attacks, people are realizing now that actually running stuff in production in the cloud is actually a much more secure environment from the get-go. So we're seeing a dramatic shift to running in production environments in the cloud rather than just running up as backup. I think that's the first takeaway. And the second one is that just the landscape is really changing in terms of technology, especially with the advent of generative AI. So in the same way that we want to democratize access to computing power and storage and solutions, we also want to dem- democratize access to generative AI and foundation models. So one of these building blocks, one of these services that we've launched is actually a, a service called Bedrock. And Bedrock allows um, users to access different foundation models through APIs. And so if you build Bedrock into your solution, it will actually allow the broadest choice of different foundation models for your use case because we f- fundamentally believe that one foundation model will not rule them all. There will be hundreds, if not thousands, of different foundation models available for different use cases. And they'll also be broader in terms of data. It won't just be large language models. There'll be large imaging models and large pathology models based upon clinical need. And so I think this is really interesting in terms of the diversity of the ecosystem. And again, what we would like to do is power this and scale it up and make it more broadly available globally. Yeah, Dr. Lynn, that makes a lot of sense. Compelling vision. That's all the time we've got on the beat right now. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for Thank you, the opportunity. Welcome to Debate. My name is Peter Birch. We're here at Health Europe 2024. I'm joined by Richard Stubbs, Chair of the Health Innovation Network. Hey, Richard, how are you going? Hi, Pete. It's great to have you here. Um, I've been excited about this. I'm really keen to learn more. I've seen from a distance about the Health Innovation Network. Um, what is it? Tell me a little bit more what about it? why it exists. So the Health Innovation Network is uh, a network across England, the entirety of England. It's made up of 15 separate organizations. The reason it's there is because we have to accelerate the adoption of innovation in the NHS in particular. Mm. We are great at invention. We have world-leading academics, clinicians, researchers, innovators coming up with all manner of things about how you transform the way you deliver care. But if that doesn't happen everywhere, then you're not going to get the full benefit. So our job isn't to do the research. It isn't to get into um, the ideas stage. It is to work with the innovators, work with the NHS and think, here's a great thing that's proven and evaluated. Every single patient in the country needs to be able to benefit from that. And while doing that, we're helping our innovators to grow. 
we're helping to create jobs, jobs for our local economy, and good jobs equals good health as well. Yeah, right. No, I, I think that's great that there's a lot of focus on that messy middle part, you know, between the two important key stakeholders. And uh, that's where often in that translation piece of taking an idea to execution, it, uh, it falls down. So what are some of those activities that you're performing with either of those stakeholders to get them from that point of an innovative idea into, into real life? Yeah, and a lot, a lot of it feels like, you know, you get yourself in the middle of, you know, the NHS and innovators it feels sometimes as a job that you're kind of a translation service Mm -hmm. because everyone's coming into this thinking what I want to do, I want to do for patients. You know, the NHS wants to do it for patients, our innovators want to do it for patients, but sometimes they just miss each other. So with the innovation side, a lot of this is about helping them to navigate the NHS. You know, it's an incredibly complicated place. There's, There's a lot of front doors to knock on. If you're an SME in particular, that's a lot of shoe leather and a lot of coffee. So how can we help them to have bigger, better conversations at a place level, a regional level, sometimes a national level, so they can have a single conversation. But at the same time, how can we help them to get better at their own value proposition? Talk in a language that the NHS understands. You know, if you're going to sit there in front of a medical director, a nursing director, yes, you want to talk about cash releasing savings, and yes, you want to talk about efficiency, but really, you want to talk about how does this help clinical staff, how does it help patient benefit? Those are the kind of numbers and the metrics that the NHS needs to hear. So how do you help innovators learn the language of the NHS? From the NHS's point of view, how do we help them to become better signalers of their demand? Because actually, when I started this job 10 years ago, the NHS didn't broadcast well its needs. And so innovators were kind of coming to our virtual front door saying, have you got a problem that fits this solution? You know, we need to get better at saying, these are our pain points. You know, these are our priority areas. We need help on CBD. We need help on elective backlogs. We need help on prevention and well-being. We need to send that signal out there so that people start working on the stuff that we actually want. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense that, well, it's obviously the NHS or, or different parts of the, um, the system are going to have different needs at different times. And, and to be able to get the most out of that uh, arrangement that, that fits well, um, what are some, and you, you touched on a few examples of those before. I saw the pre, that um, just recently you were up on a stage and this point around health equity was a big focus yeah. for you. Is there a role for innovators, innovators to play in, in kind of enabling some of this health equity? Is that why that was an... Yeah, I think it's massive. It's absolutely massive. We had a great talk on the main stage here on Tuesday. Um, some amazing, phenomenal international speakers. I was moderating it. They made my job very easy because they just had to just say, off you go, be clever for 40 minutes. <laughs> But the conversation was really about, there's almost a, you know, I think on the stage they described this as the crossroads. We could really mess up if we think about tech and innovation within the context of the current infrastructure. So if we just digitalize current ways of delivering care, we are going to bake in the inequalities that already exist. Mm. So we're going to exacerbate health inequalities um, if we just carry on doing things where we've always done, but doing them digitally. Conversely, there is a way that tech can be a huge beneficiary agent to better health equity. Well, you've got to think about that from the outset. So you've got to think about the digital divide. You've got to think about how we reach um, communities who have um, uh, worse access to data, worse access to devices, worse access to confidential spaces. There is no point putting digital first pathways out there if the communities that they're aimed at are the very communities who can't access them. These aren't insurmountable problems, but they are barriers that are going to really put us in a bad place unless we think about them. So yeah. health equity, health inequalities and tech, huge opportunity, but also I think some major challenges if we get it wrong. Yeah, and, and uh, to, to be fair, it can be difficult to build solutions that kind of fit for everybody. And sometimes it's like, well, yeah. let's build that to suit the majority so that then, you know, we can work on the rest. But sometimes in healthcare, you know, those that need the most amount of care are in that kind of the bottom end. So in, t- in terms of how you might suggest to innovators or anyone within the health ecosystem to really kind of address the needs of health equity, particularly to those that might be of, as you mentioned before, the, in those communities of need or perhaps even the diverse communities that um, uh, would require uh, particular attention. And I think you've got to think very carefully about those groups of people and think about, but we talk a lot of things, I think, about pathways, as if pathways have to be, it has to be a single pathway that everybody has to walk down. And actually, I think more and more, I mean, we saw this in the pandemic. 
there is something about the fact that, for starters, face-to-face -face care will never go away. Yeah. But actually, how does digital, therefore, become a way that we can, we can take away a huge proportion of the population who are comfortable with digital pathways? And therefore, we're freeing up resources. We're freeing up face-to-face -face resources at a, at a, a healthcare provider level for those people who need that face-to-face -face, um, um, support. So there's definitely something about it's not, um, you know, everybody doesn't have to fit in the same box. I think when you, when you are thinking about tech and innovation that is aimed at reducing health equity, you've got to think about the research. You've got to think about, you know, think about how we've got this wrong in the past. I mean, we did so much work on pulse oximetry in the pandemic. Mm. And it turns out that pulse oximetry is pretty useless when it comes to people with black skin. I mean, how did, how did a product like that get so far down the pipeline from a research point of view without recognizing that it was unfit for a huge amount of our population? So innovators have got to look to examples like that. They've got to think about what are their um, population cohorts that they're using to, to test and research on. These days, nearly everything has an AI component. How do you make sure that AI isn't being built with inherent biases you know, we've seen things like you know, the use of medical textbooks and things like that, which, you know, over the decades have had inherent bias in. There's only just really being um, realized. How do we make sure AI doesn't go down that same path? Yeah. But ultimately, to be honest, it's the same message that you give them and would have given them over the last few years. It's you've got to put a patient in the center. You've got to think about all patients and you can't just build something for only one fraction of society. Yeah, that, that constant remains for sure. Hey, here at Health Europe, there'd be innovators from all over the world and within Europe that uh, would be interested in um, uh, providing their services into the UK. Is the common pathway to go through the Health Innovation Network? Yeah, it is. I mean, there's <laughs> we have so many single front doors in the NHS, you know, we could, <laughs> we, could, we could have an entire street of single front doors. But it, it's not the only route in, but it's definitely a good route in. I mean, there are so many... Uh, fantastic organizations as well as the health innovation network in the uk so we've got a, a really well resourced national institute for health research so it depends on what stage innovators are at but certainly if they're at the point where they are in the market in their home countries they have a product or a pathway change that's being used it's been evaluated it's got real world data then the health innovation network is absolutely the place to come and and talk to us and if we're not the right conversation, we'll get you to the right conversation because we're all about trying to reduce your friction when it comes to how you do business with the NHS. And then the next question is obviously, well, which health innovation network? There's 15 across the country. To be honest, it doesn't really matter. They're all amazing. They do some great stuff. Uh, we work as a single national organization together. So the 15 of us meet, talk, have a governance that covers all of us. If you touch upon the wrong one, if you knock on the wrong door, we'll get you to the right door. But ultimately, check out the website, you know, Health Innovation Network. Find your local Health Innovation Network and start, start there. Yeah, amazing. Hey, as we're wrapping up uh, uh, Health Europe 2024, lots of key takeaways and insights and new names and faces and connecting with some old ones too. Any kind of key things you're taking away back to the UK to um, uh, share with others? Yeah, I mean, apart from an amazing um, unicorn walking around with a sparkly jacket, which is, you know, that's, <laughs> that's that's, yeah. that, is my key, that is my key takeaway. I think innovation is a team sport. And you can see that on the floor here. You can see that in all the conversation that happens. You know, innovation isn't led by one part of the healthcare system. It needs the innovators. It needs business. It needs life sciences. It needs our healthcare providers and our leaders and our clinicians and our academics. You've got all those people here at Health. So the conversation is really rich. And you need all those players on the pitch if we're going to really get the benefits of innovation felt globally. So true. Richard, that's all the time we've got on the beat. Thank you so much. Cheers, Pete. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Talking Health Tech. Make sure you like and subscribe and share this episode with someone who might find it valuable. For more information and resources about healthcare innovation, visit TalkingHealthTech.com.